So this morning um, and afternoon and evening, wherever you happen to be, we're going to be talking about positive youth development and leveraging youth to lead. So we have a fantastic panel lineup with us today, including youth from Mozambique, Namibia, DRC, and, uh, and Zimbabwe. So we are excited to hear from all of them and um, thank them very, very much for joining via video in advance, uh, as well as via in person. So just to start, in terms of who we're talking about when we talk about youth and young people specifically, there are lots of definitions out there. And so when we talk about youth, um, in the case of USAID, our definition is quite broad and includes 10 to 29 year olds. But we recognize that a number of um, other institutions, organizations have various different definitions of youth. It is important to recognize that there are different approaches and developmental needs that span this whole, this whole age span of 10 to 29. So when we're talking about the needs of a 12 year old, we're not talking about the same needs that a 24 year old might need. I would also point out that within PEPFAR, which is one of the programs that I work on specifically, youth are actually defined as ages 15 to 24 or so, but we also talk about adolescents and we kind of overlap and say adolescents are 10 to 19. So again, you know, we recognize that there is a lot going on over those years and a lot of developmental stages that uh, need to be specifically targeted and programmed to. When we talk about the global youth population, there is a lot going on and USAID very much sees this as fantastic opportunities to be doing more with youth globally. When we think about Africa, which is a continent that USAID is working on a lot currently for our health programs, there is a real opportunity if we invest in youth that youth can be an incredible support and contribute greatly in our communities. In many countries like Malawi, the population of youth may, um, may be 35 to 40% of their population broadly across Africa. In Malawi, individuals under the age of 30 compose 70% of their population. In Kenya, the population under the age of 30 is 75% of the population. So USAID really recognizes we need to do more uh, to focus and optimize um, the engagement and investment and support of young people. So what can we do better? Let's talk about that a little bit today and that's why you all are here with us. This is the definition of positive youth development that is being used currently by USAID. This was actually developed by our Youth Power Project um, a number of years ago. And we have found that this is incorporates many different of the very important aspects of uh, youth development. So positive youth development engages youth along with their families, communities, and or governments so that youth are employed to reach their full potential. And this recognizes that positive youth development approaches build skills, assets, and competencies, fosters healthy relationships, and strengthens the environment um, and transforms systems. Why is USAID and specifically our health programming? So why are we using a positive youth development approach? USAID through Youth Power, the Youth Power Learning Project uh, pulled together this systematic review a number of years ago that showed that positive youth development approaches had significant positive outcomes in sexual reproductive and HIV outcomes. So there you have it. We know that positive youth development approaches work for young people. When we talk about positive youth development, what are we talking about? Well, specifically, we are talking about 
uh, working with youth and recognizing that we need to be working with youth on a number of different platforms and fora and using a variety of different approaches to meet youth's overarching, more holistic needs. So we need to be working with youth and supporting the development of their assets. Um, and that is many of their skill, the skills such as soft skills, such as communication skills, such as skills that are important in socio and emotional um, learning, as well as cognitive learning. We also need to be supporting their agency. And that is we need to be supporting the, the ability to use those skills. We recognize that youth have a lot to contribute in their own communities and within their governments. And so that is an essential part that we should be pulling out and honing in on in terms of those contributions. And last but not least, we need to be thinking more about the enabling environment or the environment surrounding and supporting young people. So when we think about young people, we do recognize, or we need to recognize that one size does not fit all. So we need to be thinking USAID and many, many um, other partners, donors, et cetera, in the past thought more about youth as, you know, and approached it as youth as risks. And we have really changed our, our tune here and recognize the opportunities when we engage and employ youth, but recognize that we need to do things differently. We need to be thinking of the, um, de the developmental needs, the age and developmental needs of young people in terms of where they fall in an age range and the approaches that would be most applicable to them. We also need to be thinking more about how we can leverage and utilize this socio-ecological approach. And that is thinking of the youth themselves, as well as their family, as well as their communities, as well as their governments and the systems, and how we can layer um, various different approaches that are applicable to a young person across all of those different environments. And then we also need to know that even if an approach that we've designed is perfect, couldn't be any better, we need to be thinking about the environment in which that, that activity and that youth is living in and recognize that we need to be thinking of, even if it's a health intervention, you know, if there are other things going on in their community that make their communities unsafe or less stable, then you know, our approach may not work. So we need to be thinking of it as a multi-sectoral um, approach. Okay. And, and then I just wanted to add in, you know, youth, we are not talking about a monolith population here. We're talking about many different experiences that young people have that are coming into the, the programs that our implementing partners are supporting. And so it is important to meet and greet each youth in terms of their unique needs and experiences. And with that, I will turn it over to our next presenter. So thank you very, very much. And I'm turning it over to Jess. I'll stop. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes, Jess, we can hear you. Great. Good see. morning, everyone. Hi, this is Jess Williams, and I work at USAID in the Office of HIV AIDS, and I'm supporting the DREAMS program in Mozambique. For those of you who are not familiar with DREAMS, it is an HIV prevention program that seeks to reduce new HIV infections among adolescent girls and young women through the package of evidence-based multi-sectoral intervention designed to address the complex and multifaceted drivers of the HIV epidemic. The program targets the most vulnerable AGYW, age 9 to 24, across 16 countries to support them to be determined, resilient, empowered, AIDS-free, mentored, and safe for dreams. 
Today, you'll hear from one of our Dreams Ambassadors, Shayla Mirabate, and um, she'll talk a little bit about her key role serving as a linkage for navigating girls um, to service providers, as well as serving as an advocate. And I'm going to play a pre-recorded video from Shayla, and then she'll be available for questions. One moment. While I bring up my screen. Are you able to see it? Yes, Jess. Uh, saudações. Meu nome é Sheila Maribata, tenho 21 anos de idade. Uh, sou natural da cidade da Beira e residente uh, do mesmo distrito. Sou embaixadora Dreams e estou no programa já há mais ou menos seis anos. Entrei no programa desde a fase de moto e comecei mesmo a trabalhar como uma ativista. A posterior passei a ser mentora. Então, atualmente sou embaixadora, uh, mas as embaixadoras, uh, aliás, não sou a única embaixadora do Dreams, uh, tenho outras colegas em outros pontos do nosso país, aqui em Moçambique. Uh, como podem ver aí na imagem, temos embaixadoras uh, da província de, Sof de Sofala, uh, temos também na província de Maputo, Zambésia, Gaza, é um, dentre outros pontos, não é? Então, ao longo da nossa apresentação aqui, uh, irei destacar alguns pontos que fazem parte ou que fizeram parte uh, da, do nosso dia a dia, da nossa seleção. I'm sorry, I'm not sure why it stopped. Let me see. Até os dias de hoje. Então, nós passamos, uh, tivemos um treino de mídia, tivemos educação financeira, passamos uh, por um treinamento de, de, de mídia, uh, de, também tivemos uh, habilidades para a vida, educação da vida sexual e reprodutiva. E, bom, não é? então vamos começar mesmo a falar de quem somos nós. Né? Então, uh, nós somos a voz das raparigas, uh, ao nível da nossa, das nossas comunidades, ao nível do nosso país, nós somos advogadas dessas mesmas raparigas, para dar o apoio, para dar o suporte a elas, para que saibam que nós estamos sozinhas neste mundo. Então, nós uh, também levamos, uh, identificamos dificuldades dessas mesmas raparigas, uh, traçamos planos de ação e executamos. Também conseguimos uh, reportar histórias de sucesso uh, a quem do direito, não é? E essas mesmas dificuldades também reportamos de modo a ter ajuda ou mesmo para resolver qualquer tipo de problema relacionado a essas mesmas raparigas. E nós também... Uh, somos representantes, de uma forma resumida, de todas as raparigas ao nível das nossas comunidades, das mentoras, das uh, educadoras de pares, das ativistas, que estão dentro do Dreams. Então, nós respondemos em nome de toda essa camada. E nós somos raparigas que passamos por um processo. Somos raparigas que vivemos... Uh, algumas dificuldades que conseguimos superar, pelo menos até então, e temos uma história de sucesso que nós levamos como uma ferramenta de trabalho, de modo a ter mais raparigas que possam olhar para nós como espelho e que possam seguir o nosso exemplo. E falar, vou falar um pouco também do, do nosso trabalho, né? porque nós fomos selecionadas e fomos formadas, então nesse treinamento nós passamos por, por vários, vários percursos, posso assim dizer, onde tivemos um, um treino de mídia, onde aprendemos a comunicar melhor uh, com as outras pessoas, nesse caso, uma comunicação interpessoal. Uh, também aprendemos a saber como nos expressar da melhor forma possível, como comunicar com os outros, como dar uma boa sessão, uh, como convencer ou fazer com que as raparigas uh, possam estar retidas nos nossos clubes, não só como também tivemos a literacia financeira. Então, com base nesta literacia financeira, nós uh, já sabemos como fazer 
a gestão da nossa, das nossas finanças e também é ensinar as outras raparigas como poupar o pouco dinheiro que elas conseguem, como abrir um negócio, como fazer uma boa gestão financeira. E também tivemos uma visita né, a uma associação denominada Ishikam, é uma associação que trabalha e acolhe as pessoas que convivem com o HIV SIDA, são pessoas que apoiam as outras pessoas que convivem com o HIV SIDA, que dão suporte, dão apoio, para que elas saibam que não estão sozinhas nesse mundo. Então, com essa visita, nós também aprendemos que é normal as pessoas conviverem com, desta forma, com esta doença. Então, nós também levamos um aprendizado muito grande, porque tivemos muitas histórias de sucesso, ou seja, muitas histórias pessoais das pessoas que convivem é, com a HIV e SIDA. Elas narraram suas histórias na primeira pessoa. E isso foi um grande aprendizado para nós, porque foi um, foi um, um aprendizado que nós levamos para a vida toda e nós levamos mesmo uh, como uma ferramenta de trabalho para poder encorajar as beneficiárias que têm testado positivo ao nível dos nossos círculos de interesse, ao, ao, ao nível das nossas comunidades e também ao longo do percurso da formação nós tivemos a uh, educação de habilidades para a vida em que também levamos como uma ferramenta de trabalho para as nossas beneficiárias, para as nossas mentoras, porque também nós damos o suporte, auxiliamos a elas ao nível uh, das comunidades e no seu dia a dia com o trabalho. Porque é nossa missão também auxiliar as mentoras no terreno. E, bom, não é? nós também uh, tivemos uma visita a, 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 ao SAS, a SAG esse da, da, da Macia, neste caso, não, tivemos dois, duas visitas, neste caso tivemos uma visita no SAG de Marraquene, na província de Maputo, e também tivemos uma visita no SAG uh, de, de, de Macia, ou seja, da Macia, uh, na província de Gaza. Então, uh, nesses SAGs nós uh, tivemos um bocadinho mais de abertura no conhecimento naquilo que diz respeito à vida sexual e reprodutiva uh, dos adolescentes jovens contraceptivos, uh, procuramos saber se os jovens uh, têm aderido aos planeamentos familiares, uh, nesse caso aos, aos serviços de contracepção e mesmo uh, para, como eu posso dizer, testagem. E nós fomos descobrindo uh, que realmente essas unidades sanitárias, ou seja, esses sages, esses cantinhos reservados simplesmente para adolescentes jovens, para que possam ou que pudessem ter serviços clínicos, realmente está sob efeitos positivos, porque o nosso trabalho de mobilização não só é feito ao nível das comunidades, mas também é feito através das, das unidades sanitárias, por sinal, é uma das portas de entrada para que as raparigas sejam beneficiárias de RIMS, incluindo também escolas, né? no, no, no slide a seguir tem aí ah, algumas beneficiárias em que encontram-se em atividades desportivas, elas ah, estão, são raparigas de uma dada escola, não é? então ah, nessas mesmas escolas criou-se também alguns clubes ah, feministas, ou seja, clubes, clubes femininos de futebol, em que em algum momento também faz parte de igualdade de gênero, porque em algum momento olhava-se como futebol fosse uma atividade somente para os rapazes. Então, com essa atividade que está aqui, por exemplo, envolvida nas meninas, temos aí uma atividade de dança, canto e dança, porque realmente isso incentiva os adolescentes e jovens a estarem retidos nos nossos clubes e também para que eles possam ter um bocadinho mais de motivação em participar, e não só como também temos tido peças teatrais, uh, onde os adolescentes jovens já aprendem de uma forma diferente, para além de ouvir, que é com a prática, a encenação. Então, uh, essas formas dinamizadas também criam uma certa curiosidade nos jovens em continuar a participar nos nossos círculos de interesse. E também nós temos uh, uh, cursos vocacionais para as beneficiárias que necessitam ou que tenham um certo critério, nós identificamos elas ao nível das comunidades, 
ao nível dos círculos de interesses para que possam se beneficiar dos cursos vocacionais. E lá tem vários cursos, as raparigas... Jess, why don't I try my video? Sorry, what is the issue? The video is actually um, a bit blurry. The screen is quite blurry. So I'm wondering if I should try from my side. Um, okay, or you, I'm sorry it, about that. No, that's okay. It's just now, it's just now cleared up, by the way. Yeah, it, it did. Do you want to try again, Jess? Um, let's see. When I play it, is it blurry? It's perfect now. Okay. Do you want me to go back at all? Should I no, go back? Just, okay. I would just go ahead and continue and we'll share the link with our colleagues also so that they can um, see this ag again in the future. But Thanks. this Sorry is perfect. Thank you. Angela escolhe se quer fazer inglês, português. Tem também a agronomia. São vários cursos, na verdade, que as raparigas escolhem. E também temos aqui uma visita em que nós fizemos um engajamento feminino, ou seja, um grupo de poupança, em que também faz parte do nosso dia a dia, no nosso trabalho. Nós também temos, temos feito grupos, ou seja, apoiamos também aos facilitadores de poupança em fazer a melhor gestão possível nos seus clubes para poder a ter maior participação das raparigas, colocar em prática os aprendizes. Acontecido em todos os clubes, ou seja, em todas as províncias onde o Dream se implementado. Então, essas atividades têm acontecido normalmente. Então, basicamente, essas são as atividades que nós temos envolvidas ao nível Uh, do Moçambique, ao nível das nossas províncias, como também é o nosso dever criar referências ao SAS, criar demanda à unidade sanitária, isto é, criar uh, uh, referências, nesse caso, da, da comunidade para a unidade sanitária, de modo que as beneficiárias conheçam o seu, o seu estado da HIV e SIDA e também, em algum momento, há uh, referências que se criam da unidade sanitária para a comunidade, reintegração escolar, raparigas que estão fora da escola, nós temos feito com que elas voltem a estudar através da reintegração escolar e também tem tido subsídio de educação para que elas continuem a estudar. E, bom, uh, Jéssica, tem mais algum slide? Uh, essa é basicamente as atividades que as embaixadoras Dreams de Moçambique desenvolvem no seu dia a dia e muito obrigada pela atenção dispensada. Hi all, sorry about the video quality. It looks like it went out again. Um, but that was um, the end of the video. I'm not sure if we're taking questions now or We'll take the questions at the end. Thanks so much, Jess. And Jess, um, and as for our, uh, the video, we will go ahead. Uh, Jess was good enough to put this up on YouTube. So we can go ahead and share the link in the chat. Jess, if you don't mind putting it in, that would be excellent. And folks can review it also. We will also have um, some of our Dreams Ambassador colleagues from Mozambique on the line, some of those that participated in the video um, for the Q&A session. So next session, um, I'm going to turn it over to our colleague Alex Levy from FHI 360, who will share her screen and she will share a, um, a video from our young colleagues from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So thank you, Alex, and over to you to talk about the Youth Programming Assessment Tool. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Alex Levy, and I work at FHI 360. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit about the Youth Programming Assessment Tool, which is we call the YPAT. Um, the YPAT is meant to help youth organizations reflect on their own internal programming and institutional practices and identify areas for improvements. The reason that it was created was because 
we realized that while there's a lot of focus on organizational capacity and making sure that like finance systems are aligned and HR policies are in place, there was not much support for technical assistance and figuring out exactly what your gaps are when you're trying to do youth programming. So with that in mind, we reviewed over 20 youth program assessment tools, held consultations with experts and co-designed this tool in Jordan with a, a group of youth organizations, youth serving and youth led organizations. And we piloted it in both Jordan and Jamaica to make sure that the language struck a chord with people in different countries. Um, we wanted to make sure it was accessible and understandable. And there's three, I just realized you can see my screen, right? <laughs> yes, we can. Right. It's <laughs> um, perfect. There's three primary goals that we see as for the YPAT. The first is to promote reflection among key program staff with the youth beneficiaries. The idea is not for the program staff to just think about what's going well and what's not going well on their own. It's really to bring in this, the youth and the structured process as part of this. It's the second piece is to generate data. Um, the positive youth development and PYD framework, it can be a bit abstract and it's a little bit hard to know exactly what you should be doing. So the YPAT was designed to help create concrete examples for what PYD looks like when it's actually operationalized. And the third piece is to gain perspective, to make sure that we're getting youth perspective on the program service and including them in figuring out what needs to be changed and how to change it. The YPAT was created for really any youth serving or youth led organization um, with an organization that has programs that targets ages youth, youth ages 10 through 29. Um, it can be used on multiple programs or on specific programs. So you might just have one youth program and you can use the YPAT just on that, or you can do it on a higher organizational level. It's very tied to the PYD framework that Elizabeth was mentioning earlier. So there's four main sections. The first is assets and agency, which really discusses ways to um, build skills in an effective way and facilitator skills and practices that will be useful for youth as they're learning these skills. The second piece is contribution. So thinking about how can you create more opportunities for leadership? How can you better involve youth in program design, implementation, and decision making? And how can you really empower youth to participate in the community? And the third section is the enabling environment, which is about fostering relationships both between youth and adults and peer to peer and creating a sense of belonging and membership, setting positive norms and rules and expectations, creating a safe space, both physical and also an emotional space where they can feel free to voice their opinions and feel safe that they're gonna be heard and not uh, discriminated against. And then integrating your program better within the family, within the community, on all those different socio-ecological uh, levels. The fourth piece that we added was the youth lens on organizational capacity. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of different organizational capacity assessments like an OCA, um, Organizational Performance Index, the OPI, um, the OCAT. So the list goes on and on. And so the YPAT was designed so that way you could take this section and kind of stick it into one of these organizational capacity assessment tools and really be able to see, okay, but my governance structure, I now have a board, but how can I get more youth voice into that board? Or maybe what are the barriers that youth might be facing in our recruitment policies that we don't even realize they're facing that have made it difficult for youth to be staff on our programs? So that's kind of the idea of that section. Um, there's kind of three groups of stakeholders that we see as being involved in this assessment. The first is a facilitator. Um, it could be an internal person, but we've often, often seen that organizations prefer an external facilitator just because it's easier to mediate if there's different scores involved. Um, and sometimes it's helpful to have that outside point of view. The second group is youth. Um, so we specifically set it up as having youth reflection groups where you would select five to 10 current or recent programs per group. You can have multiple groups if you choose. And they're involved in using a separate kind of simplified tool in order to provide their feedback. And then the third group is this assessment committee, which should include five to eight program staff, maybe an executive director, people who are very familiar with the program and the organization, as well as at least two of the youth from the youth reflection groups. And so this is kind of how we make sure that the youth are kind of integrated into this whole process. The
Oh. Alex, we have lost you. If you are still there. Okay, Alex might have left. Um, okay. It looks like we are having some technical difficulties, unfortunately. Um, and poor Alex's uh, laptop forced her to restart in the middle of her presentation, as happens sometimes. So um, with this, why don't we transition over and <laughs> start? Um, I can't see the chat box but I am hoping that someone else might have the chat box. Have there been any questions that have come up yet that we can see? No questions. No questions yet, okay, great. I will, why don't we keep going and we will come back to the presenter. So why don't we transition over with apologies Let's transition over to talk about the TARP tool that was developed with support from USAID's Office of Population Reproductive Health. And we are going to hear from our colleague, Dr. Jeanette Bukhanran. Jeanette, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Lisbeth. Can, it, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we see the slides also. Okay, great. I'm sorry, I can't put on my video. Uh, just I have some internet issues. So please bear with me. Okay. So um, yeah, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be part of this discussion. And I'm going to present like you, Elizabeth said, um, about the, the top tool tool for AY outreach responsive planning that has been developed under the Evidence to Action project. So my name is Jeanette and I work for Pathfinder International. So uh, TAP, um, it's an instrument that enables uh, young people and those uh, who support them to use uh, their voice, to use their voice to improve uh, adolescent and youth reproductive health at scale. Uh, it, provide, it does provide a social opportunity uh, for youth participation and learning about planning, but also about evidence-informed practices. But again, it also provides uh, quantitative data to support uh, adolescent and youth reproductive health advocacy efforts for increased funding and more effective planning. Let me give you now a quick overview of how TAP journey started. As you can see in this slide, I just want to give you a snapshot of the different steps that we took uh, to get to the current version of TAP. And I think it's worth mentioning that even though the latest version of TAP uh, can be used with any family planning and reproductive health plan, uh, TAP was primarily inspired by the National Coastal Implementation Plan, CIPs. Uh, we started with a paper-based version of the, of the tool. Then we, we tested that with uh, the Wagadugu Partnership Family Planning Ambassadors. But as we were moving forward, we wanted to facilitate global access to the tool and then created um, created a digital version of the, of the tool. Now I'm going to give you a quick overview of how the tool actually works. Um, TAP users has to go through uh, a series of, of steps to perform his analysis and get to the recommendation page. First, it's really crucial for the users to master the structure of the plan that he or she is going to assess. 
because getting to know how the plan is actually uh, organized help the user to select the tool functionalities that sound uh, more relevant for that exercise. For instance, if the plan is presented in a way that does not give specific activity with their budget, uh, of course, it won't be possible for the user to assess the allocated uh, budget to youth activities. But then he will be able to access how strong is the plan in terms of using evidence-based strategy for youth programming. So once that step is very clear, the user will now input some basic information about the country and about the plan and now get started. Uh, now, through uh, a participatory and interactive process, youth advocate will then enter a plan, the, the, the activity, all the activity that is in the plan uh, into the chart. Into the he, he will then go ahead and classify activity into specific categories, as we know, uh, like supply, enabling environment, demand, and coordination. Uh, here, uh, the user will have then to uh, analyze youth focus activity uh, alignment with the seven evidence informed practices in the tool. Uh, and he has to make that determination of whether the, acti the selected activity is whether it's fully aligned or partially aligned or not aligned at all with the evidence informed practices. However, um, the tool does provide useful additional resources to help the users make that determination. So as such, even user, users that are not very familiar with evidence practices can learn more about these practices as, as they go, uh, I mean, as they are using the, the, the tool. Uh, TAP is also uh, to enable users to suggest improvement to the quality of proposed activity and make overall recommendation to policy and program decision makers. That's a very important piece of TAP as it doesn't just make sure to analyze the plan, but also provide, you know, a uh, um, platform for the young people, the youth advocate to, to make, you know, great recommendation to the policy uh, advisor. Then uh, here I'm just showing some results that we can, you know, when, what, where we landed after we do all the analysis and TAP does uh, uh, produce attractive, um, attractive and printable results that can be used for advocacy. Three level of result to mention. The first level is the country analysis, where users learn the proportion of activity and budget uh, that are located in the plan to address specific family planning and reproductive health needs uh, of young people and compare this information with the country specific data. The second level of, of result is what we call um, the activity analysis where you can see what domain of family planning programming has been prioritized in the plan. Remember the supply, the enabling environment, the demand and the coordination I mentioned previously. Then thirdly, the, the result also we give the qualitative assessment uh, and, and, help, and help the user to know to what extent the plan activity were developed based on what works. Now let's see uh, where and by whom the tune has been used so far. This slide shows some of the TAP use events that Evidence to Action and other partners organized throughout the Ouagadougou Partnership region and in DRC. And one key thing to note here is the development of the of TAP curriculum uh, to facilitate greater use of the tool why ensuring that TAP continue to be a living resources after E2E ends. And I think here it's also to note that we have developed a theory of change uh, to help guide both implementation and documentation of TAP use. I'm just giving here some of the results from countries where TAP was used to assess the national uh, costed implementation plan. Uh, and you can see this, these are from Senegal and Togo, 
uh, uh, and those these results are currently being used to inform the third generation of CIPs in this country. Again, here the result these results are from the Niger, from Niger, uh, where the assessment was carried out under the leadership of the adolescent health, health department of the Ministry of Health. I want to end my presentation just to say that, uh, as I said, uh, uh, we were on this journey uh, of TAC journey hand in hand with, with young people, mostly from the Ouagadougou partnership regions. And here, just one of them, one of the heroes of, of TAP in the region, he's called Ivan. Um, he's a vibrant advocate, a trainer and supporter of TAP from the beginning till now. And this, this is just a quote that he shared uh, through a video that uh, it always supported him to produce uh, uh, during the closing, and he presented during the closing plenary uh, session of the virtual ICFP uh, that was held some month ago. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, uh, if, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer any question if there is any. Thank you so much. Over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Jeanette. And I'm glad um, the bandwidth worked for us this morning from Burkina Faso. Yes. So, Jenny, <laughs> Me too. For, I was, thank you for joining us. I this was afternoon. very worried that. You... <laughs> well, thank, thank you. So you. It worked perfectly. <laughs> okay, Alex, I think you are back. I think our moderator is going to make the view a bit bigger so that um, our participants can see the screen a little bit more clearly. Uh, so technical model let you do that. And in the meantime, Alex, I think you are back with us. Um, and it's good to know that everyone, every institution has their own technical updates that are rolled out at inopportune times. And so Alex, you are back with us. Um, would you like to start sharing again? Yeah, can you, can you see my screen? We can, thank you, Alex. We are back with the youth programming assessment tool. <laughs> Sorry about that. I guess now we're all pretty used to all these technology issues, but um, still annoying every time it happens. Uh, so yeah, so I'll just try to wrap it up quickly. Um, so I just wanted to give a brief overview of kind of the steps involved in the YPAT, which is that the first step is obviously to select who would be the youth involved, who would be the committee members involved, and what the dates would be for the meeting. The second piece is the actual scoring for the assessment. Um, and that would be the, there's two pieces that would be involved in that. The youth reflection groups where the youth are provided a form with more youth accessible questions since the full YPAD can be a little bit heavy. Um, and they complete that as groups and then choose those two representatives to join the full assessment committee. We ask that people will score the assessment form individually first, everyone in the committee, just so that way they know the examples ahead of time. And then they'll come together and jointly score. And then the third phase is about really reflecting. So what, what do we do well? What could we be improving? And what are concrete actions that we could be doing that would be useful for our organization? Um, just quickly, so this is what a youth reflection form looks like. You'll see the second column is specific to questions for the youth to answer, like, do you have different kinds of opportunities to practice the skills? Do you do role plays, mock scenarios, just to kind of help contextualize what we're looking for in responses. And then this is kind of an example of the assessment form. So the standard is in this light green color. So for example, program seeks to recruit a diverse group of youth. And the reason I like this, this is one of my favorite standards because I think most organizations would say they recruit a diverse group of youth, but then they might just be looking at male and female, like gender divide or one specific type of diversity, instead of looking at the full picture of all the different ways that you can get a diverse group of youth involved. And then this is the action plan. Um, so you would actually create an action who's responsible and set it up um, so that way you have actual timelines. And so now I'm gonna share uh, the video with you all. Um, so this is with uh, three youth who are involved in our integrated youth development activity in the DRC, and they participated in the YPAT and are sharing their perspectives on how it impacted 
their um, organization. So let me reshare with the video. Give me one second. Okay, can you see the video? We see Which it at the stoplight. Au début, je vis en outil. Uh, une opportunité d'amélioration et aussi des performances professionnelles au niveau des générations épanouies parce que j'ai compris que avec la mise en place de l'outil iPad ça va permettre à ce que la communication les rapprochements entre les staffs et les jeunes ainsi que leurs besoins ça veut dire mettre au centre des besoins des jeunes et ça m'a donné un espoir dans les jours à venir pour le développement de la communauté mais aussi des activités et la prise en compte des besoins des jeunes. Je vis une nette amélioration par rapport à l'organisation des générations épanouies, la collaboration entre les staffs et les jeunes, et ça, ça a été trop bénéfique pour nous. Par exemple, au début, après la mise en place de l'outil iPad, Génération Épanouie a mis en place un programme d'accompagnement et de renforcement des capacités des jeunes. Ça consistait à outiller les jeunes qui venaient, venaient exactement fraîchement de l'université euh, d'une manière professionnelle. Et j'ai eu la chance de participer aux premiers jeunes qui ont été recrutés dans les programmes de volontariat au sein des Générations Épanouies. Et dans ces programmes, j'ai travaillé avec l'aide du staff et de tous les, les, les membres du staff au bureau. On a travaillé dans des projets, euh, des, rédiger des termes de référence, faire des activités de terrain, des récoltes, des données. Et ça a été pour moi une base parce qu'après ces programmes de volontariat ici, j'ai eu à travailler ailleurs. Et là où je suis partie, j'ai eu à mettre en évidence les acquis, à, euh, les acquis que j'ai réussi des générations épanouies, de sorte que quand j'ai fait un travail et que j'ai remis par exemple pour la rédaction des projets, des termes de référence, des rapports d'activité, j'ai remis directement à mon chef, c'est qu'il n'a plus à mettre beaucoup de correctifs et il me renvoie le travail, il me responsabilise même certaines activités parce que maintenant là je suis assistante au programme et tout ça j'ai acquis grâce à Génération Épanouie et grâce au programme, ça m'a permis de me développer et tout ça c'est grâce à l'outil iPad. Mais grâce aux Génération Épanouie, nous comme personnes vivant avec un handicap, nous sommes assez bien par rapport, parce qu'auparavant nous étions négligés et quelquefois nous étions timides on ne savait pas même notre valeur en société. Et quand on a commencé à collaborer avec GP, on a, on a découvert beaucoup de choses par rapport à nous. Et GP nous a formés dans beaucoup de choses. En matière d'abord des droits de l'homme, leadership, comment exploiter notre, poste, notre intelligence intelligence comment donc s'associer à d'autres personnes à travers ça à travers beaucoup de choses que j'ai pu nous a aidé pour moi. de bien exprimer nos besoins de critiquer la manière de faire de l'organisation et de donner des suggestions voilà pourquoi Wipat a été un bon moment pour nous c'est en ce sens que nous avons donné des recommandations au staff à Isadek de la manière dont l'organisation sera en train d'agir à notre faveur. Euh, nous pensons que Aïsadek a adopté un comportement aussi positif en faveur des jeunes. C'est-à-dire, Aïsadek a pris en compte tout ce que nous avons suggéré et personnellement j'ai quelques éléments à indiquer Merci. par rapport à cela notamment le fait que les relations d'abord entre jeunes et staff à Isadec sont devenues plus, de plus en plus solides par rapport aux demandes nous avons eu des formations additionnelles se rapportant à la résolution pacifique de conflits 
technique de plaidoyer et campagne et leadership et à ma qualité maintenant de juriste Aïssadek m'a accompagné à intégrer les corps des défenseurs judiciaires et avec les techniques que j'ai acquises cela me permet actuellement de bien défendre les causes et les intérêts de mes clients ok um, so that was the quick video and um, Elizabeth I guess back to you Thank you so much, Alex. I uh, really appreciate the presentation and especially appreciate hearing from our young colleagues in DRC. So many thanks to them for putting together and to FHI 360 for putting together the video. Next, I will hand it over to our colleague, Edwina Shimbango. Um, from our, uh, who is a DREAMS ambassador in Namibia working with Project HOPE. She will talk about the HIV prevention ambassador toolkit for adolescent girls and young women for PrEP. Edwina, we will hand it over to you. <laughs> Great, we see your screen. We just... Excellent, thank you. Okay, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Edwina Shumbango. I'm a DREAMS Ambassador at Project Hope Namibia. I will be presenting on the HIV Prevention Ambassador Toolkit for Adolescent Girls and Young Women for PrEP. The DREAMS program is implemented by Project Hope Namibia and other five partners that can be seen at the bottom of the screen. And it is funded by PEPFAR through USAID. It was first awarded in June 2018 and will be running until June 2023. Our goal is to avoid new HIV infections among adolescent girls and young women with our primary target population being adolescent girls and young women at the ages of 10 to 24. Our secondary target population are the parents the caregivers and sexual partners of these adolescent girls and young women and the communities they reside in. DREAMS is currently active in five districts of the three regions in Namibia, which is Oshikoto, Comas and Zambezi region. Our DREAMS core package of interventions includes the primary, secondary and contextual interventions, which are age appropriate and our Health services that are provided by DREAMS is HIV testing, family planning, post-violence care, condoms, and PrEP. At DREAMS, we have a very flexible service delivery modality which, where services can be delivered in, at two levels, either at the health facility or in the community. At health, in the health facility, a girl can be initiated at the clinic, at the health facility. Follow-ups can also be done at the clinic or she can choose to have a follow-up done at the safe space. In the health facility, services are provided in youth-friendly rooms and in prep clubs. And in the community, a girl can be initiated in the community either at the safe space and she can have a follow-up done in the safe space or she can choose to have a follow-up done in the, at the health facility. Now in the community, services are delivered um, during HIV prevention education sessions, out of school safe spaces, in school safe spaces, or even door to door visits, which is particularly done during COVID lockdowns. And the DREAMS ambassadors were recruited to coordinate and promote the DREAMS program and to roll out oral prep. These girls are adolescent girls and young women between ages 10 to 24, who have completed the DREAMS program or are still beneficiaries, who reside in the area of assignment and should be confident in public speaking. Part of the DREAMS ambassador's role is to mobilize the program to their peers, to represent the program at various platforms and educate on, advocate for and champion PrEP, including SRH and post-violence care. Part of a DREAMS ambassador's role is also to trace 
adolescent girls and young women who have discontinued using PrEP and also to form PrEP clubs and to, to form PrEP clubs in order to increase adherence on PrEP usage while our girls are still at risk. We also participate in the development of communication strategies, including PrEP, and of course, providing feedback on program implementation. The ambassador toolkit here is used in performing most of those tasks that can be seen here on the screen. We have various PrEP implementation resources, which includes the national guideline for ART that is used to inform program activities. The HIV Prevention Ambassador Toolkit, which was used to train the ambassadors, is used as an important resource here to, to raise awareness on PrEP and to run our day-to-day -day activities. On the right-hand side of the screen, we can see a PrEP flyer, which is one of our IEC materials used to educate and also raise awareness on PrEP. The HIV Prevention Ambassador Toolkit comprises foundational knowledge, which includes human rights, biological vulnerability to HIV, HIV basics, gender inequality and violence, and responding to disclosures of violence. Here we were trained on, we are trained on, on a, we're, we're trained on, a, excuse me, we were trained in, a, in the lives approach, which is used as a first line support for survivors of violence. And ambassador skills that are contained in the, in the ambassador toolkit includes peer support skills, boundary setting and self care. We were taken through a short training course on public speaking in order to boost our confidence when engaging with our peers. The prep section in the Ambassador Toolkit contains extensive information on factors affecting adherence on oral prep, um, getting to know about oral prep and staying on oral prep. In August 2020, Project of Namibia established partnership with FHI 360. And in September 2020, a selection of multidisciplinary training team was done by Project Hope Namibia, followed by a training needs assessment survey conducted by FHI 360 and Project Hope Namibia. Thus then followed an adaptation of training materials for virtual training of trainers by FHI 360 and a virtual training of trainers was done by FHI 360 for the training team. And at the same time, the recruitment and selection of the DREAMS ambassadors was underway. In the following month, Project Hope Namibia received the HIV Prevention Ambassador Toolkit from FHI 360, which was done to conduct the training of the DREAMS ambassadors. And the DREAMS ambassadors also graduated in the same month in the presence of the Deputy Chief of Mission, of American, of the American Embassy to Namibia. In the background picture, you can see myself being awarded my certificate by the DCM. And in November 2020, the Dreams Ambassadors were deployed to their communities and introduced to the key stakeholders of their communities. And the implementation of the Ambassador Toolkit also started. My role, being a Dreams Ambassador. I'm provided with the opportunity to interact with my peers in a caring and non-judgmental way, which also helps me to assist my peers in thinking through their solutions creative, creatively, and also empowers me to build my self-efficacy and to overcome my self-limiting thoughts and doubts. And I believe with the necessary support and knowledge that I've obtained from the training and that I also gained from my day-to-day -day activities, I can always find ways to improve my life and the lives of my peers. And through my personal experience, I can say I contribute to challenging the stigma around the stigma and fear around contraceptives and PrEP. And I also promote understanding of sexual reproductive health and the use of protective methods, which is taking charge of one's life. And I believe this is a key to an empowered future. On the right hand side of the screen, you can see some of my colleagues engaging in a panel discussion with UNAIDS executive director and my other colleague at the panel discussion at the national TV. 
we can say that we have learned that engaging adolescent girls and young women in program implementation has multiple benefits, which includes providing opportunities for leadership among peers in the community, which informs and strengthens youth-friendly approaches with focus on empathy and support. This also improves the quality of HIV and SRH services and supports girls to make informed HIV prevention and SRH decisions which is done either by the ambassadors and other dream staff. This also decreases stigma attached to the use of services, including PrEP, which I've mentioned earlier, and it really improves the social assets related to communication, assertiveness, problem solving, decision making, and goal setting. We can say that this increases autonomy, self-advocacy, and self-efficacy, and also ensures that young women are valued and provided economic opportunities which I myself is fortunate to be part of. Thank you for our very captive audience. Thank you, Edwina, for that presentation. You did a fantastic job and we really appreciate hearing about your experience uh, as a DREAMS ambassador and many thanks to Project HOPE for all of your support. With this, we will transition over to our next presentation and hear about the network of youth change makers in health and specifically the launch of the Youth Lead Health Platform. And from, for this, we will hear from our colleague in Zimbabwe, God Knows, Simbarashi. God Knows, over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think you have to give me the rights to share my screen. Okay, we are working on it. Our, I'm sure our moderator will be working. Uh, Excellent. It looks like we're maybe going over to you, God knows. Okay, okay. Just one minute. I would want to share the application window on the... Okay, um, Ghana, I think, okay. So if you switch to the screen, to the presentation, we should be, we should be good. Okay. Excellent. Okay, you are there. God, God knows you're good to go. Okay, thank you. Uh, greetings, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is God knows Mperekezwa from Zimbabwe. I'm a public health practitioner and um, also currently serving as a, a wellness coach. So I thought of sharing these pictures with you first. Uh, these uh, actually <clears throat> entail some of my roles that I have uh, performed in terms of my public health expertise, in terms of uh, community engagement, in terms of uh, uh, epidemic preparedness and response. And to my bottom left, uh, it was a, a panel where we discussed a, a burning public health uh, topic and other pictures and engagements, they are actually in international engagements uh, that are, are mainly driven by my enthusiasm uh, on global health. So I don't want to spend more time uh, talking about myself. I want to go straight into, into the business of the day. So uh, we have heard uh, a lot about youth-led youth and uh, the, the power that the uh, the positive youth development approach yes, when it comes to global health programming. Like what uh, Elizabeth has said, it uh, realizes assets, the assets uh, that the youths have, and also uh, their ability to leverage on those, what, on, on, on those assets. And by so doing, the uh, approach also uh, uh, appreciates the importance of creating an enabling environment when it comes to global health programming, especially programs that are related to 
to the youth. The youth need an uh, enabling environment in terms of uh, uh, in terms of their opportunity, their inclusion, and also uh, th their voice also has to be what has to be heard. So that enabling environment is important when youth want to drive their uh, their uh, youth led uh, programs. So as a change as a change maker now, what you need to do now through the use of the youth led platform. The world is growing global. We are becoming one family. Therefore, you need to get connected. The connection you can get uh, is a connection with people. And also, you need to be connected to the necessary resource. So as young leaders, as young change makers, you need to be at one place, at one network, so that you harness opportunities, you share ideas, you learn. You can surprise me. Uh, surprise me I can get... a. Uh, uh, the evidence from Namibia and use them in Zimbabwe as a benchmark. I can also share my lessons from Zimbabwe and use them in another, in another continent as well as, as benchmark. And on top of that also, since we are going global, there are also uh, funding opportunities that can be obtained by youth. That can only be done by youth maybe who are innovative, youth who are creative, youth who are also passionate about driving change uh, for for their uh, fellow counterparts, and uh, and also uh, you are exposed to to projects. So out of these projects, you expect uh, you extract the data that you need to use in your particular country. And the data you can you can just validate it and use the tools in your what in your country. So the youth led now uh, the youth led platform now it has realized about about three thousand six hundred members uh, and. Uh, the website is about 160,000 uh, people visiting the, 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 the platform. And then out of those people who are interacting with that youth-led platform, there's been a, a quite significant number of those who are interested or who are interested in public health, who are interested in health initiatives, and those who are actually an, are partaking health initiatives like myself. This now has given rise to the youth-led health platform, which is also a baby of the youth-led uh, uh, facility. So the platform is there to drive the health initiative. The platform is there to make sure that there is the youth inclusion in driving, in designing, in implementing, and monitoring and evaluating all programs, even those that do not include uh, uh, the youth. So. As a status now, we need now to have a base, a base in terms of uh, starter kids. So a starter kit is just a, a framework to help a youth to model a program. So the youth now, they have to have that access to those starter kits. They have to uh, have access to those evidence-based approaches uh, that are there, that, are, that have been tried and tested. So that they want now to maybe formulate projects related to mental health, gender-based violence, and some, uh, some other campaigns that are run. So they have that easy access. So we should create that kind of a culture within our youth that uh, allows them to research, allows them to share ideas, allows them to what to share uh, resources. So amongst the activities that are also there, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to share uh, with you that recently I've just done uh, an Instagram live uh, discussing about the role of youth in creating healthier communities. I think that's uh, I also testify my passion for youth inclusion in health-related matters. We are also hosting other webinars that are ongoing uh, through the youth-led social media handles. And also of importance now, there is that opportunity for you to have a peer-to-peer -peer network, network where, we, where you can actually interact with your peer. Then at some point in time during the year, there is a call for application now where uh, the, uh, the youth-led members now, they call for application to be a youth-led ambassador. So you go through the application process and I tell you it's a very rigorous pro uh, process. During our time, there were about 11,000 applications and they will be wanting about 22 to 25 uh, people globally. So it's a, it's, during the application process is a, itself is a, a, a learning process. So you learn, but should you fail to, to qualify, you should never lose hope. 
join the lives, join the campaigns that are there, and also share your, 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 your ideas. So my experience now uh, with the youth-led platform, like I said, I'm very passionate about public health. So I've learned how to engage the youth. The youth, uh, in terms of uh, the demographic shift and the uh, demographic dividend that is uh, stated in the positive youth uh, development, I have learned how to approach the youth in, in all the uh, relevant uh, uh, dimensions. And also, in terms of health system strengthening, how do you put all the sectors together? How do you strengthen a, a health system? How do you include the youth in, in, in the what into the health system? And the evidence obtained for, from the research now, you use the evidence and you advocate for a policy change. You advocate for a, for youth inclusion. You advocate for uh, for bigger strategies uh, to to include the what the youth and global health. Global health. The COVID nineteen pandemic has taught us a lesson that the issues pertaining to our health should never be a a thing of a nation, but it should go global. So the global health drive now is important that we create a hub of youth. youth from different religions, different races, and different uh, continents, so that we create our, our our knowledge space where we share ideas. Then we should never do anything without research, learning, and 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 development. Then what you should now do next? This is the take home message that I'm giving to my fellow youth to to join the youth led platform and also the organizations that that are youth led the youth led organizations be the CSOs be the, the trust be the PVOs they should also register so that they also get funding opportunities now there is a funding gap and that gap can also be in, they can also be closed through the utilization of those one of this platform and authentic now uh authentic connections with uh, necessary uh, people, necessary organizations that can offer expertise and also uh, the resource. So uh, because of our time, I would want to go deep, deep into this. Maybe we can prepare for another webinar sometime. But these are some of the useful links that uh, whoever is watching me right now, they can access this use so that they are, this link so that they uh, they make use of the resources that are available there and, or, and learn on mental health and learn on uh, engagement, especially engaging youth using the digital uh, digital platforms, which is very, very important. We are going digital. The pandemic also has not been this in the comfort of our homes and houses. I want to thank you all, everyone who has been listening to me and everyone uh, following proceedings and my take home message to the youth is that uh, the youth the sky is the limit we should keep on and keeping on like i always say the moment you step on the roof the roof ceases to be a roof it becomes a floor definitely the sky is the limit i thank you all thank you god knows you. very much for that presentation i'm so glad that you could join us today and share that information on youth lead health so thank you again uh, with this, I will turn it over to my colleague, Jane Schuler, who will lead us in the question and answer. Jane, over to you. Great, thank you, Elizabeth. And thanks to everybody who's uh, shared their presentations this morning. Really nice, uh, nice work, despite all of the uh, technological challenges. Um, so I thought that we would just start with um, what we've seen come in with the um, in the Q and A, and one point related to the youth programming assessment tool that Alex talked about earlier. And there was just a comment from that that I wanted to share, which was that um, someone said that they have piloted the youth programming assessment tool successfully in a number of different language environments, for example, in Spanish and the Dominican Republic. It was a very powerful experience for partner organization, partner organizations. So wonderful feedback regarding the, the YPAD and, and one can see the great potential there with that particular tool. Um, Let's see, uh, there, 
There was also um, a question that came in. What do our youth leaders see as the key emerging challenges or issues facing young people in their communities? So I'll just put that out there to participants in the session. Um, and maybe you can reply in the chat and then we'll, uh, we'll give just a couple of, of seconds for, for, for folks to, to respond. Again, what do our youth leaders see as the key emerging challenges or issues facing young people in their communities? Anybody in the chat or any of our presenters from, um, from across the globe want to jump in? God knows, or Edwina, if you're there, do you have any thoughts on emerging challenges or issues that are facing youth in their communities? Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, thank you very much. I think uh, <clears throat> youth are facing a diversity. Uh, uh, they are facing different uh, different problems, which are attributed to different things. Uh, number one uh, is their inclusion. So th the policies that are crafted now, sometimes they 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 are not they 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 do they do not accommodate uh, the youth. Why? Because like in many countries, they are kind of borrowing their legal framework from customary laws. So the customary law is driving policies, is driving uh, legislature. So these laws are crafted in the absence of the youth. So sometimes they, they craft laws out of customs, out, out of morals, without necessarily involving the, what, the youth. So by so doing now, it results in a, in, a, in a conflict between the policymaker and the youth. So the solution to that kind of a, of a challenge is the youth have to be understood in terms of their their uh, their demo, different demographics. Number one, they have to be understood in, in terms of their needs and wants. So we should address their needs on and, and wants. At the same time, teach them what what you want to be observed morally, not prescribing something to them. To them. So upon doing that, uh, we are we happen to face so many challenges. Are related to the what to to their inclusion in all these programs. Great, thank you. God knows a powerful response to that question. We appreciate it. Um, we also had a question for you, Alex, on the um, youth programming assessment tool. Um, and that question is: Are there any particular recommendations for how best to train youth for using the tool? Over to you, Alex. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So we're working on kind of a training material for just in general on how to facilitate. And one of the hopes is that youth would be able to facilitate. So right now in Zambia, for example, we'll be training a bunch of our youth lead alumni um, on how to use the tool. So I guess um, keep posted. I shared the website. And so there will be, hopefully um, we'll be uploading up those tools soon. Um, but in general, it's, it is pretty straightforward. You would just need to start with like a basic positive youth development presentation just to, so they have that backing. And like, as long as they understand kind of that framework, then I think that they'd be able to pick it up and run with it pretty easily. Okay, thanks. Well, I see that we are very quickly running out of time. We had hoped to do a whiteboard exercise with everyone on the call to think about um, what donors and partners can do better. What should we start doing or stop doing? Unfortunately, we won't have time to address that, but I'll leave that question with all of you, um, our participants, to, to begin to kind of think about that. And hopefully um, some of what was presented today will help in answering that question. So before we wrap up, I'm gonna uh, hand it back over to Elizabeth, who's just going to give a couple of closing remarks. Thanks all. Thank you, Jane. And thank you so much to all of our presenters this morning. Again, apologies on the technical challenges uh, we, we ran into, but we appreciate you all bearing with us. 
Uh, I, in terms of the question that remains, in terms of what USAID and other donors can do better, in terms of leveraging youth to lead, if you do have specific feedback or thoughts or input, please do feel free to email me and I will share the information with our co-presenters today. And my email is in my presentation at the very end. It is the first letter of my name, E, and my last name, Berard, B-E-R-A-R-D, at USAID.gov. We appreciate everyone joining us today and look forward to this ongoing dialogue in terms of what we can do better and positive youth developing programming for our global health programs. This is an area that you'll see USAID continuing to lead and continuing to promote in the near future. Thank you very, very much. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Take care. <laughs>